Good afternoon and welcome to the Wall Street Crossover Show sponsored by Admiral Markets with the market commentator, Darren Sindon. Good afternoon, Jack. Good afternoon. Right, um, FOMC um, delivered a message last night. Uh, do you actually know what they were on about? <laughs> Not really. I think I'm right in saying that, the, that there were three words that were different in this. In July, solid. Delighted delight statement, yeah, rather than, um, than June. Some solid and another. Um, look, I'm not one for pouring over the semantics. I don't think there's much to be gained from that. I, I, what, what I took away from last night was that the, the Fed fund futures rates basically were un, un, unmoved, unchanged. You know my view, longer for lower at least um, until December 2015. Um, and you know, I think it could, could extend into, uh, into the new year. Um, there seems to be something for, for everyone um, in what, what they said last night, and you know, each market that what we hear thinking of here of equities and FX seemed to take what it wanted to from the statement and ignore. So equities a bit better. Yeah, in general. and the dollar appears to have firmed as well, um, and yet, and yet the equity market would be better on the idea that rates weren't going up, and uh, the dollar, uh, the dollar yes. firming on the fact that they on the thought that they are. So, pay your money and you take your choice. Sir, okay, well, let's go into something which is more understandable, which is the data released over the European session. Okay, well, um, I've decided to look at a couple of uh, key points from uh, from Spain today. So, first of all, we had the flash or like preliminary GDP growth rates uh, quarter on quarter. So, for the second quarter over the first, and that came in at uh, plus one percent, as bang in line. Uh, with a forecast of plus one percent and a small increment to the prior read of plus 0.9 percent, and the trend in this in this number is, to, is that it's continuing to trend higher from the 2013 lows. But no sooner had we digested that than we had the uh, the, the harmonised index of consumer prices. This is the ECB's preferred measure of inflation across Europe. This is again the Spanish number. Uh, this is for July. On a year-on-year -year basis, I'm looking at this now, minus 0.1%. Um, the forecast was for it to be flat at 0.0% and indeed the prior read was exactly the same. The concern here is that it came in negative. It's dipping back to deflation after two flat reads and this number has been trending lower uh, since November 13. So on the one hand, we've got you know an improving uh, GDP economic growth story and on the other hand we've got uh, the the inability of the economy to generate inflation and the, well, and it's, the concern it's, that it's dipping uh, back into deflation so it's a good combination of growth without in, without rising prices what else do you want well you, you do need you do need some some inflation to, to, to drive asset values and to, and, to, and to get everybody to feel a bit better off but uh, we'll see it's one number but it's still going to be a cause for concern and then uh, moving over uh, to Germany we had uh, the German unemployment rate of change. Um, so, sorry, first of all, the unemployment change for July. Uh, so, 9,000 uh, more people were unemployed in July than they were in June. Uh, the forecast had been for a dip in uh, uh, unemployment by 5,000 jobs versus the prior read of a, a gain of 1,000. So, it's a bit of a mixed picture as far as German unemployment is concerned. That those numbers not big enough to actually make a, a great or any real difference to the unemployment rate, which actually came in at 6.4% um, against the forecast of the same number. But the truth is that uh, that rate stayed flat. It hasn't gone sideways, flatlining, if you like, since March. And I don't suppose um, the Germans will want to see you know, too many more months where we actually see even a small rise in the actual number of new uh, unemployed claimants. Uh, cause, okay, so possible cause for concern there as well. Right. Okay, well, let's uh, move along to the European movers. Um, all positive uh, on, as far as the stocks we're looking at today. First of all, Nokia. Uh, we touched on these recently, um, mentioning the fact they were going to sell their mapping business to a consortium of German automobile manufacturers. Uh, today, they reported numbers. Uh, they reported a rise in sales and profits. Um, management um, said it was very much focused on reducing costs and driving efficiencies. And I think what the market particularly to liked was the fact that margins were sharply higher in the same period last year. I think I took right in saying they might have been 80 percent better than they were over the prior period last year. Uh, they also said that their deal to take over Alcatel Lucent is on track and that should close in the first quarter of 2016. That the net net of all that is that the shares are trading around six euros 41 up by more than seven and a quarter percent this morning. And then um, Anglo-Dutch um, company Royal Dutch Shell, one of the world's biggest oil producers, RDSA, the ticker in London. They also had numbers today, uh, but it wasn't so much about the individual numbers as 
what the management said that they were going to do. So they've committed to the dividend, uh, at least for the next two years. Um, they've committed to their ongoing share buyback, to, which will basically run up to a total of $25 billion worth by 2020. Um, and they showed what they, how they were going to set their stall out with some, some significant cost reductions across 2015. They've so far saved around $4 billion There's per annum. There's more to come in 2016. And as part of that, they are cutting six and a half thousand jobs worldwide. Um, the stocks traded up by around four percent to eighteen pound thirty-five. The, the only thing really that I could see in the numbers that that, that might queer the pitch was the idea that uh, oil prices might return to a range of between seventy and ninety dollars. Looking at the current uh, state of play, that seems somewhat unlikely to me. But uh, well, maybe they'll have a hand in that by producing but, less. And well, that's quite possible. Up. Sir. It's interesting that their their share buybacks more than their BP will be paying. Uh, for the damages at uh, deep water, so uh, yes. so, so you know, so that's how, that's the difference uh, in terms of uh, spending power or cash available. Yep, absolutely, yeah, indeed, and that's a very good point, well made. Uh, so if we move on to our next slide, M and A rumours and movers. So I, I thought we'd deviate slightly from uh, from the norm here and just have a recap on a couple of stocks that we've uh, we've mentioned recently. So firstly, uh, NCR, the old National Cash Registers in the US. That's and surprisingly, ticker NCR um, up around 3.6% uh, yesterday at $30.39. They had Q2 numbers uh, yesterday. Readers or viewers, if you like, might recall that we flagged the stock as a possible takeover candidate back on the 20th of July, which is just over a week ago, it seems an age ago. Mm -hmm. um, so the Q2 numbers were a bit, a bit mixed, a beat on earnings, but they missed on revenues. They did reiterate full year guidance, so make what you will of that. What I think was was most important was uh, they on the conference call they basically said that the strategic review they're undertaking is ongoing and it would conclude in the near future. Um, the thing here to bear in mind is that, that three significant private equity groups have, have been linked to the company recently. They include KKR, Tomo Bravo and the Ontario Teachers Pension Fund. Um, so they're not without potential suitors. So watch this space. And then another stock that we flagged um, slightly more recently on the 23rd of uh, July was Citrix Systems, that's ticker CTXS in the US, uh, closed last night at $75.27, that's up 8.1%. Uh, um, we flagged these just for his historical purposes at 71.05, so they've done quite nicely in that short time frame. Uh, Q2 numbers and guidance were mixed, again they released figures, but, but again it was more about what they said than the numbers they produced. The CEO is to retire. Um, they've struck a deal with their activist shareholder Elliott Management uh, and the, the management board will conduct a comprehensive review of its ongoing activities and will consider spinning off the uh, go-to meeting, go-to webinar business that, uh, that Elliott would like them to sell. So um, again, watch this space. Um, uh, I'm sure that won't be the last we hear of this uh, you know, over well, the near term. Go-to is a market leader. It certainly is, yeah. Okay, well let's uh, go on to... Uh the US data points. Okay, well no sooner have we got uh, the FOMC out of the way than we get uh, second quarter GDP numbers uh, from the US, so they're due out this afternoon. Uh, the forecast here is for 2.9% um, annualised rate um, at versus the prior very poor read of minus uh, 0 0.2. Now of course the low read uh, last time round was, was based, well, blamed really I should say on the west coast port strike and a very very cold winter uh, at least that's what we were told um, also I should point out that they're they're rejigging the way that the, the numbers are calculated and uh, that some some sort of salves will be applied this time around and again in the following quarters so it's going to be a bit difficult to compare apples with apples um, so, so it will, but it will nonetheless be interesting to see what the read comes in at and then perhaps um, of even more interest will be the weekly jobless claims because it was one thing that the Fed did talk about last night was the labour market and they, they used the phrase some improvement to the labour market would be sufficient now to con for them to consider raising rates. So um, a forecast of 272,000 uh, jobless claims for this week against uh, last week's 255,000 number. Uh, that number last week was a multi-decade low for, for reading July. So uh, let's see if we uh, if we come anywhere near that or whether we, we stay around the forecasted level of 272. If, if, if we get a lower number, then I suppose you can infer that a rate rise is nearer. And if we get a higher number, well, then it's further off. And it could be um, that the higher number is uh, the better number because that means rates are staying lower for longer. We shall see.
Right, OK, I think I understand that. Um, let's go on to the market movers and levels. We've got a curious market situation, obviously, with the run-up to a possible interest rate, rate rise, where good news is bad news and vice versa. Um, what are we looking at here? Well, all bad news in terms of, uh, of market pre-market movers. First of all, Corvo Inc., that's QRVO, uh, $61.49, uh, down 12.74% uh, pre-market. Um, weak guidance um, from the the mobile chipset maker last night, they saw slowing handset demand in China and they said many of its customers, or some of its customers at least, had what they felt was excess inventory. Uh, not good for them because these, these firms are typically paid on, on throughput and royalties and licenses and so for, if, there's a, if there's a backlog of, uh, of supply they don't get paid as much. Um, and then Facebook, uh, the latest of uh, the, the new world internet economy stocks to report again after the close last night, $94.75, down 2.24%. Uh, um, why? Well, with all these stocks, it's all about the margins, the the, the rates of growth. And though they, and though revenue revenues grew in Q2, uh, the rate of growth fell sharply compared to the prior prior growth levels. And so, that, and also the management suggested that, that trend would continue in 2015 and that some costs within the business are rising. So, so yes, it's it's going well. It's growing. It's growing significantly. And probably most other businesses, the rates of growth would be would be seen as fantastic. But uh, uh, you know they've set themselves a hard yardstick with their past performance. And much like the likes of Apple, and as we saw with Twitter, it's very hard to uh, to please the market when you when you've set such a, a decent benchmark mm -hmm. in the past. Okay. And in terms of levels to watch today. Um, Better for choice in Europe, but nothing too exciting going on. Um, in terms of the FTSE, 66.50 is our downside level, uh, plays 67.11 um, on the upside. The DAX is probably the best of the bunch in, in the European indices at the moment. So 11,125 is a downside there, 11,300 to the upside. Sorry about the wide range, but again, it's just searching for uh, for directional cues, really, and trying to find a, a practical level. Um, as we said, um, you know, each each of the markets took its own view on the Fed last night. As we said, equities uh, really rallied quite sharply in the state. So in the S&P now, we're back to 2094 on the downside, plays 2115 on the upside. Again, a wide range, but uh, you know we're looking for a final definitive directional cue. And in the Dow, we play 17,630 against 17,790 there. Uh, Euro dollar, um, the dollar strengthened and the euro weakened, so 109.44 on the downside now plays 109.90 to the upside. As far as Aussie dollar, uh, US dollar is concerned, there's a slight widening of the range today from yesterday. So 72.60 plays 73.20. Um, dollar yen is probably the one that had the biggest move, so we're back above 124 there. Yen weakness, dollar, dollar strength decided we will which way that plays, but 124.00 plays 124.48. And I would say the bias is very much to the upside today. And then in cable, 155.86 plays 156.50. Um, I don't really know what to say there. You know, cables held firm probably. People are thinking that we, if, if anyone goes first, it could be the UK rather than the US. But again, I'm sceptical in that. OK, well, that's a bit of a puzzle there on, on cable, but we'll obviously no doubt find out in the coming months. Uh, Darren Sindon, market commentator at uh, Admiral Markets, thanks for coming in today. And uh, we'll be back at the same time tomorrow.